Good evening, and welcome to the 2016 Springfield Music Lecture. I'm Mona Kreitner, Assistant Professor of Music at Rhodes College, and I am delighted to provide introductory remarks for this evening's lecture. The Springfield Music Lectures at Rhodes College were established through a bequest of the late John Murray Springfield, member of the Class of 51. Each year, the lectures bring to our campus an outstanding musicologist, conductor, composer, or music theorist who presents both formal lectures and informal conversations designed to foster an increased appreciation of music as an academic discipline for our students and for the community. We are pleased that tonight we have John Murray's brother, Jim Springfield, with us. Mr. Springfield, would you please stand and let us show our appreciation for your continued support of this extraordinary program. Thank you, thank you so much. The importance of John Murray's bequest to Rhodes is evident in the quality of our guest lecturers. Beginning in 1991 with Mozart scholar Jane Perry Camp, and most recently featuring David Huron, distinguished professor of music and head of the Cognitive and Systematic Musicology Laboratory at The Ohio State University, our roster of Springfield lecturers includes composers Morton Lauridson, Jason Robert Brown, and Jennifer Higdon, conductors Sir David Wilcox, Alice Parker, and John Rutter, and scholars Charles Rosen, Christoph Wolf, and Alex Ross. Our guest for this evening, musician, musicologist, and author Ted Joya, has published nine nonfiction books most recently, the critically acclaimed Love Songs, The Hidden History. This book is the first complete survey of 5,000 years of the music of romance, courtship, and sexuality. It is from this work that his talk for us this evening is drawn. Ted Joya has an undergraduate degree in English from Stanford University, a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics, and in he is probably best known for his activities in the jazz world. His books include The Imperfect Art, Reflections on Jazz and Culture, published in 1988, The History of Jazz in 1997, Delta Blues in 2008, The Birth and Death of the Cool in 2009, and The Jazz Standards, A Guide to the Repertoire, published in 2012. His newest book, How to Listen to Jazz, is due out in May of this year. You can pre-order it at Amazon, I checked. But Ted Joya's interests cover a wide range of areas. Currently, he is composing a series of solo piano pieces that draw on jazz and classical traditions. He is published in leading newspapers and journals. He reviews and discusses popular music and culture for Salon, and The Daily Beast online, and regularly reviews contemporary fiction online and in print. Love Songs is the third in a series of books Ted Joya began in the late 1990s. These books encourage us to study, understand, and appreciate music not in the context of geographical and chronological categories, but rather as a universal human language that bears striking resemblances to itself around the globe and across time. It is a fascinating approach to the study of music, and the information in each of these books is encyclopedic, yet clear and engaging. Work Songs and Healing Songs were both published in 2006 and received ASCAP Deems Taylor Awards. I have used Healing Songs as a text in my music and healing class since I started teaching it at Rhodes several years ago. I have supplemented it over the years with books by John Blacking, Don Campbell, and Oliver Sacks, even the Oxford Handbook of Medical Ethnomusicology, thinking we needed additional resources. We didn't. And as I have tried and abandoned other authors' work, I have continued to rely on Ted's writing to engage and inform my students. Rhodes College is delighted that Ted Joya has been able to be our guest this week. 
and we hope the weather will cooperate so we can get him home safely tomorrow morning. So now please join me in welcoming our speaker for this evening's Springfield Music Lecture, The Hidden History of the Love Song, Ted Joya. Good evening. Thank you for coming out, especially on an evening with such threatening weather. Uh, and thank you, Mona, for that introduction. Uh, as she noted, I've done many things in different areas over the years, but I'm primarily a music historian. And as a music historian, my responsibility is to ask the really big questions on music. So I'd like to start this evening with asking what I think might be the biggest of all. And it's a very simple question. The question is this. Can music change your life? Can a song change your life? And if I raise that to a slightly higher level, I could ask, can music change the life of a community, such as the community we have here? Or if I raise it to still a higher level, I could ask, does music ever change the life for an entire society? And if I put it in its most simple terms, I could ask this question. The question is, does music change the course of history? Now that sounds like a strange question, doesn't it? But really, if you're interested in the history of music, it might be the most basic question of all. If you care about the history of music, you should ask yourself, does music change history? But we're not familiar with this kind of question. We rarely ask this question, and I think for a very simple reason. And that reason is, in contemporary society, we're taught to view music as entertainment, as diversion, as a pastime. We don't look to music to change life, we look to music as a change from life. Isn't that so? Isn't that how we look at music? It's something you do after your work is done. It's something you're doing when you take a break from your responsibilities, that's when you turn to music. But if you push this view too hard, you get some strange endpoints. For example, Professor Steven Pinker is an eminent professor at Harvard. And what he does is he calls music auditory cheesecake. That's his exact word. Music is auditory cheesecake. And what Pinker says is that the main purpose of music is just to stimulate the brain. It's just brain stimulation. And from his perspective, music is no different than drinking a martini or having a beer or playing a video game, or to cite one of his specific examples, music is no different than a recreational drug. But that's disturbing, isn't it? I know that disturbs me. I think those of us who love music see this and say, could that really be true? Could it really be true that there's no difference between a Beethoven symphony and a line of cocaine or LSD? I think a lot of us find, you know, I find that disturbing, but still I have to give Pinker credit because I believe Pinker has understood the way music is perceived in the common people today. Music is not seen as something of transcendent importance. Music is not seen as life-changing. Music is not seen as history-changing. Music is seen as mere entertainment. And so even though I disagree with Pinker, I have to say that he has captured the zeitgeist. He has captured I think the mood of contemporary society as it looks at music. But as soon as you step away from the current perspective, as soon as you take a larger perspective, and you begin to look at music throughout the full course of human history, and in many different cultures, you see something very different. 
You see that music is much more than auditory cheesecake. It is something of transcendent importance. I'd like to quote James Chalmers. He was a missionary who spent many years in New Guinea. And what Chalmers did is while he was there, he tried to preserve uh, the customs, the music, and the practices that he sounded. This was many years ago. And he was trying to learn about the music in New Guinea. And he was talking to a, a drummer for the Motu tribe, asking about the drumming. And the drummer said something to Chalmers that I like. He said, the drums are never beaten uselessly. The drums are always played with a purpose. No dance is ever danced uselessly. Every dance has its larger purpose. So this is very different than Pinker's view. This is very different from Pinker's view. This is very different from viewing music as just entertainment. And if you look at other traditional cultures, you find the exact same thing. Take, for example, Native American culture. If you look at the research of the pioneering ethnomusicologists who work documenting this music, you see something very interesting. I'm thinking in particular of three women who are heroes of mine. One is a woman named Frances Densmore. One is Natalie Curtis, the other one is Alice Fletcher. And they devoted decades of their life to documenting the music of the native cultures. An especial hero of mine is Frances Densmore. I have a whole shelf of books by her at home. And it's a tragedy that these books are out of print. Because she worked tirelessly over a period of decades, going from native community to community, to preserve the old songs. She saw that they were in risk of disappearing completely, and she wanted to talk to the people that knew these songs before they disappeared. And over the course of her career, she documented thousands of songs. And every one of them had their meaning and their purpose. Some of these songs helped the crops grow. Some of these songs prepared the hunters to go on the hunt. Some of the songs were involved in healing the sick. Some of the songs were done to preserve the ritual and traditions of the society. Some songs were involved in courtship and romance. But every song had its meaning. Every song had its purpose. And I think if you look at music in the large scale, you see this. You even see this in Western culture. In Western culture. We tend to think that music is mere entertainment. But many of the things we take for granted in Western culture do not exist in traditional societies. Take something as simple as this. In music, the most basic assumption we have is there is a performer and an audience. But you know, many traditional societies don't understand that distinction. For them, everybody in the community participates in the musical life of the community. There is no distinction between performer and audience. Some of these cultures don't even have a word for audience. They don't even have a word for audience. Everybody is involved. It's participatory. And many of the things we assume just did not happen in most times and places. So even if you go back to the very heart of Western culture, you see this. And by going back to the heart, let's go back really old school and talk about Aristotle. You can't get much more old school than Aristotle, OK? If you read Aristotle's politics, there's a lengthy section in Aristotle's politics on music. Now that in itself is surprising. Why do you find in a book of, on political science a discussion on music? You wouldn't see that nowadays. You wouldn't see a political scientist writing about music. You wouldn't turn on CNN on election night and hear people talking about songs. But here you have Aristotle in his classic book on politics writing about music. And it's because he saw music as part of the foundation of a good society. Music for Aristotle was one of the four foundations of education. These included reading and writing, athletics and gymnastics, the visual arts, and music. So for Aristotle, music was foundational for a good society. And then he explains why. And he goes on at length explaining why music is so important. He says music builds our character. He says music instills virtue in us. He says music prepares the soldier to go into battle. He says, music uplifts our spirits. He goes on and on, and then finally, finally at the end, he says, and yes, music is entertaining. But this is at the end of his list. And you can see that for Aristotle, this is the least important item on his list. So I would say in the present day, we have flip-flopped Aristotle. 
We have forgotten all these other purposes of music, and we focus just on entertainment. And even the language he uses seems strange to us. When's the last time you heard somebody in a conversation even use the word virtue? When's the last time you've heard someone use the word character? These words have just disappeared. And, and that's a subject for a different talk. I'm just going to focus on that's a subject for a different talk. But Aristotle saw all these purposes for music that he thought were very important. Now, if I had to describe my vocation as a music historian, I would say I could describe it very simply. I have tried to take Aristotle seriously. I have tried to take seriously the notion that music has powers over and beyond its power of diversion, over and above its powers of entertainment. And I've devoted most of the last two decades to trying to understand what this means. And I can still recall now the moment when I discovered what became my vocation as a music historian. I can still recall this. And it was because of an individual named Arthur Danto, a person who's not alive, and he never met him. I simply read what he wrote. And at the very end of the 1980s, Arthur Danto uh, wrote this essay. And he was a fascinating person. Danto had two careers. He was a philosopher, and a very good philosopher. He taught philosophy at Columbia University. He was one of the great philosophers in America of his generation. But he was also an art critic. He wrote about art, about painting and sculpture for the nation and other periodicals. And when he wrote about art, it was with a sophistication, with a depth that you rarely find in art critics. And he wrote this essay at the end of the 1980s called The End of Art. The end of art. And in this essay, he made a very bold statement. He said, the history of art is coming to an end. The history of art is coming to an end. Now, what does he mean by that? Does he mean that people are going to stop painting? No, he doesn't mean that. Does he mean that people aren't going to make any more good paintings, that all the good paintings are done, there are just lousy paintings going to happen in the future? No, he doesn't mean that either. What he is saying is that the history of art as a historical progression is coming to an end. And what he means by this is for the last 500 years, we've viewed art as something like a science, that it progresses. And the idea is that each generation has certain artistic techniques. And they give it to the next generation, who add a few more techniques of their own. They improve it. They expand it. And then that generation gives it on and on, and each generation adds new techniques, and art progresses almost as a science. Now, where did we get this idea? This idea is actually fairly recent. It comes from the Renaissance. There was a fellow named Giorgio Vasari. He was writing the history of Renaissance art, and he found that this notion helped him explain Renaissance art. He saw that there was this great painter named Cimabue, who was the first really to break away from the constraints of medieval art, and started painting in a more realistic way. And Shimabui's techniques were borrowed by the next generation, by a painter named Giotto, who added new techniques that were more and more realistic. And then came Masaccio, and he developed more understanding of perspective and the mathematics of painting. And then the next generation came. You have Leonardo, and he's building on this and adding new things with the golden triangle. And you have this whole progression where art does progress like a science. And the same thing is true for the most part in music. It's not a gross oversimplification to say that Mozart borrowed from Haydn and added new techniques, and Beethoven borrowed from Mozart and added new techniques, and Mahler borrowed from Beethoven, on and on. There is a progression in art. But what Danto says is this stopped in the 1950s and the 1960s. Art stopped progressing. Art continued to change, but it changes the way the weather changes out there. It's no longer a progression. And he says, you can't say that Andy Warhol painting these paintings of soup cans is building on what Jackson Pollock did a few years earlier with abstract expressionism. Pollock was just throwing paint on canvases. You can't say that was progress there. You can't say that, that Jackson Pollock was building on what Salvador Dali had done with surrealism. There's no progress in these. Things change, but there's no progress. By the same token in music, you can't really say that John Cage built on Aaron Copeland. You can't say that. 
You can't really say that Philip Glass builds on John Cage. And what D'Angelo says is the history of art has come to an end. There's no more historical progression. Things might change, but the steady evolution and progress like a science has stopped. And then Danto said the thing that shook me up. This is the thing that changed everything for me. At the very end of his essay, he said, what do we do now? What do we do now that the history of art has come to an end? He says, in the future, artists must go back to what has always been the most important function of art. Artists have to go back to what has always been the most important function of art, which is, you know, drum roll, please, it says filling human needs. Artists have to go back to serving human needs. Artists can't think that they're scientists. They can't worry about progress. They've got to worry about filling human needs. Now, I read this essay probably in 1989. And I was struck by it, but I had no idea what Arthur Danto was saying. It seemed strange to me. Now, I was working as a jazz musician. I'm going to go jam with my buddies tonight on play I Got Rhythm. What human needs am I filling? I turn on the radio, I hear a Beatles song. What human needs are being filled there? And so I thought Danto was an interesting writer, but I really didn't grasp what he was getting at. But you know, over the next few years, as I researched more and more into the history of music, I eventually realized he was right. That in most times and places, art fills human needs. It's integrated into the community. It's integrated into the society. It's integrated into the family, into the individual life. This is the real history of music. And then I began asking myself, this is around 1991, what would the history of music look like if we wrote it from the standpoint of actual people like you and me? What would the history of music look like if you looked at real people and how music changed their lives? You know, most music history just focuses on superstars. Most music history just looks at somebody who wrote a symphony for the king or was a composer for the pope or somebody who plays at Carnegie Hall, or some rock star that plays in front of a, a football stadium full of fans. But that's just a tiny, tiny section of our musical life. And if you focus on that, you really don't understand what music's all about. And so I began asking myself, what would the history of music look like if we wrote it from the standpoint of everyday life and how music can change people's lives? And at that point, I began researching, and the research eventually resulted in several books. It was a book called Work Songs, which looked at the role of music in our working lives, how music makes work less toilsome for the worker. And I wrote a book called Healing Songs, which looks at the role of music in health and wellness. And I published those books 10 years ago. And then I realized I had to go up against the big issue of them all, the big daddy, which is the love song. The love song. Because the love song has been the most popular type of music for the last thousand years. For 1,000 years, the love song has been the most popular type of music. And that's a music that changes people's lives. You know, at the beginning of my talk, I said, can a song change your life? And I bet a lot of you thought of love songs. I bet a lot of you thought of love songs. You know, my younger brother is a DJ. Over the years, he's had many jobs. He's been a rapper, he's been a DJ, he's been a bartender. He's, every job he has involves going to a party. That's his, every, every job he has, his job is to go to a party. But his main source, he does like casino nights, and you, anything that involves a party, he can do. But most of his income has been generated by being a DJ. And he's often DJs at wedding receptions. And he tells me that when you are a DJ at a wedding reception, the most important thing is to talk to the couple that is getting married, and you ask them, what is your song? What is your song? Because every couple has a song. It's the special song that brought them together. And as the DJ, you have to play that special song. In fact, I would say many of us would not be here today if our parents had not heard 
a certain love song at the right moment and the right place. This is true. So talk about life changing, that's life creating. So if I took seriously the notion that music can change our lives, I had to deal with the love song. And so I began working on a history of the love song. And like I say, you can trace back the first inklings in my journal on this is 1991. And I only published this book last year. So that tells you, that tells you what a huge endeavor this is. Uh, and what I, I discovered was no one had written a history of the love song. That's amazing to think about when you think how many books are published each year. No one had written a full history of the love song. And I think there are many reasons for it. One is it's just a difficult subject, because to study the history of the love song, you have to understand the history of marriage. You have to understand the history of romance, the history of sexuality, the history of courtship. You have to understand all these traditions and religious prohibitions. It's a very complicated endeavor if you really want to understand the history of the love song. But there's another reason why I think scholars have not treated this subject with the respect it deserves, which is because most of us are ashamed of these songs. Most of us are embarrassed to even admit we know these songs. You know, I meet people all the time in the, in the field who write on music like I do, and they say, Ted, what's your next book going to be about? And I remember I would tell them, I'm going to write a book about love songs. And they would give me this look. And they wouldn't say it, but I knew what they were thinking. They were thinking, that is wimpy music. That stuff? You're going to write about that? That sappy, sentimental stuff? You're not going to write about that, are you? They would have more respect for me if I wrote about the 12-tone row or heavy metal or something, love songs. But here's the funny part. I know that if you went and saw their albums or their playlists, they got all these records, too. They know all these love songs, just like I do, just like you know all these love songs, don't you? We all know the words to all these love songs. But we're just a little embarrassed about talking about it. There's a music critic I like named Dave Hickey, and he said something I thought was spot on. He says 90% of the music out there is about love. But music critics want to write about the other 10%. So 90% of the songs out there are about love but music critics want to talk about the other 10%. And I think he's absolutely right. We are embarrassed by it. Particularly men. Particularly men are embarrassed to know the words to these love songs. But when they're in the car by themselves, they'll turn on the radio, they'll sing along, but they're embarrassed to admit it. And you know, I think there are reasons for this. But you know, Darwin would have said that we have to take the love song very seriously. Charles Darwin believed all music was a love song. Darwin believed all music was a love song. He thought the sole purpose of music from an evolutionary standpoint was human mating. It brought people together. And in his book, The Descent of Man, he talks at length about music, especially about bird songs. In fact, he writes more about bird music than he does about human music. He saw these mating songs of birds were the Blueprint for all human music. And you know, when I first read Darwin years ago, I was skeptical. I thought he was wrong. And he leaves out stuff. You know, he doesn't talk at all about the music of monkeys or gorillas or apes. And for a very good reason. They don't have love songs. There are no gorilla love songs. You know, there's a, a guy named Leonard Williams. He was the father of John Williams, the classical guitarist. A great musician, and he also lived with monkeys. For many years, he lived with monkeys and wrote about it. And he had the privilege of hearing monkeys fornicate on a regular basis. I should say he had the dubious privilege of, of hearing monkeys fornicate on a regular basis. And he said they do not sing. They squeal. They growl. They grunt. They moan. But they do not sing. And I thought Darwin was wrong because he just skipped all this. He talked about birds and he skipped all this other stuff. And in the first draft of my book, I tried to explain all the reasons why Darwin was wrong. But you know, in the last five years, a lot of new evidence has come out from different fields, from neuroscience, uh, from uh, physical chemistry. And it supports Darwin's view. It shows that the same hormones in the brain that regulate sexual behavior 
are also linked to musical receptivity. And they're also linked to musical talent. And the more we study body chemistry, the more we realize that, to a certain extent, survival of the fittest is survival of the most musical. But you know, I should have figured this out long ago. And you just learn it by reading the, the biographies of rock musicians. You know, count how many partners they have. Or go hang out back of the rock concert and count the groupies out there. And you realize that society treats musicians differently. And there have been studies to document this. There was a very interesting study that was done in France a couple years ago. A guy in France went out on the street and asked random women, total strangers, to give him their phone number. He would go up and say, you are very lovely, would you give me, I know my French accent is very bad, will you give me your phone number? And what he found is at the end of the day, 14% of the women, 14% of the women had given this guy, a total stranger, their phone number. The next day, the same guy goes out, same neighborhood, same question, but this time, he's carrying a guitar case. Now, do you think that had any impact? The second day, 31% of the women gave him their phone number. I see this guy writing that down there. Yeah, this is, <laughs> see, this, this is useful information. So you're glad you came tonight, despite the weather. This is useful information. 31% of the women gave him the phone number if he was carrying a guitar case. Here's the best part of the story. On day three, he goes out. This time, instead of a guitar case, he's carrying an athletic bag, like he just came from a workout. Only 9% of the women gave it. <laughs> so guys, if you think by working out you're going to be more appealing to women, forget it. Just learn guitar. Don't even learn guitar. Just buy a guitar and carry the case. <laughs> they did a similar study last year. Facebook friend request. A guy would send a woman a Facebook friend request. But he's a complete stranger. And what he found was that 10% of the women would accept a friend request on Facebook from a total stranger. But if the same guy's picture showed him playing a guitar, it almost tripled to 28%. So we see, in fact, that Darwin was right. There is, to some extent, a mating advantage to musicians. The musicians are all smiling out there. I can, I can, I can see that right now. Yet we have this shame and this embarrassment about the love song. And where did it come from? I believe our embarrassment about the love song came from ancient Rome. I think it came from the ancient Romans. There's this great book that C.S. Lewis wrote. Now, you know C.S. Lewis maybe from the Narnia stories, or some of you may have read his books on Christianity. He was also a great scholar at Oxford. And he wrote this book in the 1930s called The Allegory of Love. And in this book, he makes an amazing statement. He says, romantic love did not exist in ancient times. He said, romantic love was unknown to the Romans. Now, that's an amazing thing, because the word romance comes from the word Roman. But C.S. Lewis says, romance was unknown until it was invented by the troubadours at the end of the medieval period. Ancient people did not have romantic love. And then he says some strange things. He says, even today, now he's writing in 1936, he says, even today there is no romance in India, Japan, and other countries. Well, I mean, these are just mind-blowing things that C.S. Lewis is saying. And much of what he says I disagree with, but there is a grain of truth. There's a grain of truth in his claim. Because if you go and study ancient Rome, and what the Romans thought, you find that, in fact, they did know about romantic love, but they hated it. They feared it. The ancient Romans thought falling in love was like an illness. It was like a type of insanity that no sane person would want to have this helpless feeling of falling in love. And so you find again and again in the literature them denouncing, them ridiculing the person who falls in love. You know, there's this great work of Ovid's The Art of Love. It ridicules people who fall in love. The Romans were all about conquering, and falling in love is being conquered. 
They preferred, now they understood that there were benefits to love. They understood that there were benefits to having a marriage, especially if you were marrying into a wealthy, powerful family. They understood there were benefits to sexual union. They understood there were benefits to having all the perks of having uh, someone that was your partner in life. But this helpless, passionate feeling of falling in love and not being able to do anything and all your future now belongs in the hands of someone else, they didn't like that. They were scared about that. They thought that was unmanly for a man who should be more focused on his responsibility than on romance. And I think in many ways we've inherited that view today. Even today, we feel that there is something a little bit, especially guys, I think something's embarrassing about romance. And this colors the way the love song was perceived in ancient Rome, where the love song was often used to ridicule the lover. So often, they often they come from the, the Roman comedies. The lover was held up as, as a, something humorous, something amusing, but not something serious. And then after Roman times, we get to the age of Christianity, and the love song had even tougher time under Christianity. For the first thousand years of Christianity, the church tried to eradicate the love song. The church tried to get rid of all love songs. And you know how you can see the impact of that? If you're a researcher, I ask you to go to the first thousand years of Christianity and find an example of a love song in the vernacular language of the common people. Not Latin or Greek, the vernacular language of the common people. Find the love songs, they say. You can't. None of them have survived. None of them have survived. Oh, a few lines have survived. You'll find some illuminated manuscript from medieval period, and there'll be the Epistle of Paul and the Book of Revelation, and in the margin, someone will have written a few lines of a dirty love song. I mean, you'll, you'll get just a little snippet like that. But you can't find a whole song. So what are we to conclude? Should we conclude that there were no love songs then? Absolutely not. There were tens and thousands of love songs. Now, how do we know they exist? We know they exist because the church leaders complained about them all the time. There were sermons all the time where the priests would say, we've got to get rid of these love songs. There were church councils saying, we've got to stop the people from singing these terrible love songs. And they almost always mentioned women. It was always the women are singing these love songs. We've got to stop the women from singing these love songs. These women are out in front of the church on a feast day, and they're singing a love song. We've got to do something about that. And so there were proclamations. There were denunciations. Charlemagne published a, a, a law forbidding these love songs. In fact, there are these books that have survived. These are very interesting books. They're called penitentials. And the penitential is a guide to a priest who's hearing a confession. So if you're a priest hearing a confession and someone comes in and says, Father, I stole my neighbor's chicken. You know, you've got to know, well, do you make that person say three Our Fathers or ten Our Fathers or a whole rosary? So the, the penitential was a guide, if you were a priest, of what was a fitting penance for certain sins. And we have three surviving penitentials that mention singing love songs. And each one says that that was a sin that could not be forgiven. You sing a love song, you're going to burn in hellfire. <laughs> you can say, our fathers from here to kingdom come. It's not going to do you any good. So this tells you how hard the church worked to get rid of the love song. But it failed. They could not get rid of the love song. And finally the love song comes out into the open at the end of the medieval period. And why does it, the age of the troubadours, why does the love song finally come out in the open? It's because the king is now singing love songs. You know, when it's some peasant woman singing the love songs, well, you can threaten her. But when the nobility begins singing love songs, what do you do? So the church had to accept the love song. And for a couple hundred years, they tried to co-opt it. You know, figures like Dante or St. Francis would try to take the love song and Christianize it. But even that failed. The love song came and conquered everything. And so who do we give credit to? Do we give credit to these troubadours, the nobles? They're often considered the inventors of the Western love song. But in fact, there's a whole tradition before them that has been mostly written out of the history books. Primarily love songs sung by women. And these are women in the lower classes. And not just in the Western world. There's this whole tradition that has been written out of the history books of these female slave singers in the Muslim world. A hundred years, two hundred years before the troubadours, there were women in the Muslim world singing very similar songs. 
The epicenter of this was Baghdad, but these songs spread all the way through North Africa. They spread into Spain after the Muslim conquest. They spread up to the very borders of present-day France, and that's where the troubadour revolution took. In the south of France, the troubadours were simply taking a tradition of these female slave singers and bringing it into Europe. And now the king is singing he's a slave to love. That's strange. How can a king be a slave? Well, it's because the person he learned that song from was an actual slave. And this is what we find is the recurring dialectic of the love song, where you have an innovation in the love song created by a slave, by an outsider, by a bohemian, by a member of the underclass, and then a, gradually it's accepted by the ruling class. And this has happened again and again in history. You can trace it back two, 3,000 years ago. You can trace it up into our own lifetimes. I mean, look at American music history. In 1850, what was the most popular love song in America? In 1850, the most popular love song in America was Oh, Susanna. Oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry for me. As I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. As Stephen Foster wrote, he's a white guy from the North, spent almost no time in the South. And this song was imitating the love songs of black slaves. Now the black slaves weren't going to publish sheet music then, but he could take this music, streamline it, present it to mainstream white society, and could become the hugest song of its day. So once again, it's the same thing we saw back in the Troubadour's age. A slave creates the innovation, the ruling class gets the credit. Same thing in ancient Rome. You know these Roman love songs I was talking about? They were performed by slaves. It was considered disgraceful for a member of the ruling class even to perform music. You heard that story about Nero fiddling while Rome burned? The scandal there wasn't that Rome burned, it was that the emperor was playing the fiddle. I mean, that was the scandal. The emperor was not supposed to make music. In ancient Rome, the slaves made the love songs. In the Muslim world, the slaves made the love songs. And then you get to the United States. And it's really the slaves, the children of slaves, the grandchildren of slaves, the descendants of slaves, created the modern love song in America. Now, in the year 1900, if I had taken people that were really knowledgeable about music, and I'd asked them to predict the future of popular music in the year 1900, what, they, what would they have said? Someone very knowledgeable about music in 1900 would have said the future of popular music is going to come from Europe. Because the most exciting popular songs are the ones in the cabarets in France, the cabarets in Berlin, the music halls in London. These songs are daring. They're filled with satire. They're filled with humor. They're, they're, they're saucy. They're rebellious. Most American popular songs in 1900 were boring and sentimental. You know, lovers in these songs never kissed, they never hugged. I mean, they were very boring songs. Over in Europe, they were very exciting songs. And it looked like Europe was the future of popular music. But as we all know, America dominated 20th century popular music. And why? This is a contribution of the, the children, the grandchildren, the descendants of slaves. Especially with jazz and the blues. The blues was an amazingly new way of singing about love, a very honest way. A way that talked about subjects that no other kind of popular music was touching. And once again, did it come from the ruling class? No, it came from an underclass. And eventually, the ruling class figured it out. And the innovations of the black underclass seeped into the mainstream culture. Or what about the rise of rock and roll? Did the rise of rock and roll come from the ruling class or the underclass? Well, the big, the big kahuna out there was Elvis from Mississippi, the poorest state in the Union, who learned his music from blues musicians. That was the revolution in rock and roll. And eventually, these things all become respectable. When Elvis first showed up, they wouldn't even want to show him on TV. It was too dangerous. But nowadays, rock musicians can go to the White House or win Kennedy Center honors, and no one thinks twice. This is the process of the love song. It starts with the underclass. It gets legitimized and then taken into the mainstream. But early on, rock and love songs from rock musicians were scandalous. You know, there was a song called Louie Louie. Some of the older people in the room here will know the song Louie Louie. This was a hit song, but no one knew what it meant. You couldn't even figure out what the singer was singing. And the FBI was convinced 
that something evil was being sung on this record. And so they put together a whole team. And I got the FBI report. It's a 100-page report on Louie Louie. <laughs> and eventually the conclusion was, we have no idea what's being sung here. And here's the funny thing. If they had just gone down the street to the copyright office, they could have gotten all the lyrics. But it never occurred to them to actually do that. But the idea was rock and roll music was dangerous. So you had to watch out for this stuff. And this is the story of the love song. And go fast forward to more recent times. What's been the biggest innovation in singing about love in the last 30, 40 years? Well, it's hip hop. Does that come from the underclass or the ruling class? Well, the underclass. Or what about the British invasion, the Beatles and all that? The British, were they invading from Buckingham Palace? No, from Liverpool, the, you know, the poor docks. This is the dialectic of the love song. It always starts with the excluded. It starts with the bohemian. It starts with the outsider. It starts with the slave. They have a certain freedom to sing about new ways of love because they don't have to worry about propriety. The ruler always has to worry about being respectful, about being uh, aligned with the rules of behavior and propriety in society. But the outsider can break those rules. That's why. We always get the love song from the outsider. And that is the hidden history of the love song. And so as I look forward and I say, what is the future of the love song? I think we will find again and again, the same thing will play out. We will have new ways of singing about love. But they're not going to come from the ruling class. They won't come from mainstream culture. They will come from the outsider, the bohemian, the person that's excluded from the table. And these will change our ways of thinking about love. And in many ways, the love song has been a tremendous instrument for expanding human freedom, civil liberties, personal autonomy. You know, people think that very little music is political, but the love song is very political. People have died. People have died because they sang about love in a new way. And when I think of my friends who think that the love song is wimpy music, I have to laugh at them because they're really missing out. This is music that has scars and has shed blood. And as I say, in the future, we will still have music like this that will change our way of thinking about love. And it will come from the outsider. It will come from the most surprising places. And I promise you, it will change our lives. So thank you very much. I'd be happy now to answer any questions. I appreciate, again, you coming out tonight on such a, uh, a, an evening of, of inclement weather. Thank you very much. So are there any questions? And we might even have a microphone around here. Yes. that it used to be. Ideas for how that might once again. This is the interesting thing you find when you read this, is that people who write about music tend to view it as entertainment. But when you actually look at how individuals use music in their life, it's much more complex than we think. I'll give you an example. There's a, a researcher named Tia Denor, sociologist. And she asked people, when you have somebody coming over to your house, your apartment, hot dates coming over tonight, what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you clean up your place, don't you? I know you're a bunch of slob. The first thing you're going to do is you clean up the place, make it look better, okay? That would be the first thing I would do. The next thing you worry about is, hey, what are you going to do for food? So if it's me, I'm going to do takeout, because you know, it's going to be pizza or Chinese, something I can get over the phone. But the third thing you worry about is the music. When she surveyed people, number three on the list was music. And people agonize. What do I play? What songs do I play? And if you, I feel sorry for these people that are hip-hop fans. 
that have got all these things with like obscene lyrics. You know, you, there's probably not a single record they got they can put on. You know, you got, you got to reach into something that's got like a little more romance. Where do you go, Sinatra? Away. It's a it's hard decision. But this is revealing. As soon as you look at how people view music, it is integrated into their lives. And if you have people keep diaries talking about what they use music for, they use it to energize themselves. They use it. Music is a change agent. Music does change our lives. So I do believe. Even I was a little bit simplistic when I say that music is mere entertainment. I, see, I should say music is perceived as mere entertainment. And if you actually dig deeper, you find that there's this whole rich life of music that almost no one even pays attention to. And we rely on music, we rely on music to enchant, to transform, to make our life better. And all of us do that. We just don't recognize it at the time. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to clarify that. I think that's an important point to make. Other question, yeah. He was asking me, um, I'm not going to try to go through that whole point by point, but he, he pushed back on my criticisms of Steven Pinker's view of music as auditory cheesecake. And this idea that, that music is brain stimulation, uh, he was saying that why, why can't we view music this way? We view a lot of things in society as, as stimulating the brain, even something as simple as drinking coffee. Uh, he, he kicked Aristotle in the pants a few times as well for various... Thing, but, but really push back primarily on this idea is, isn't music brain stimulation. This is a, this is a huge issue. This, I've got to say there's a huge issue. And I've got to say the view you just espoused, many people espouse and believe very strongly. And not just about music, about a whole host of things. And I, but if you look at music, this is very interesting. If you go on Amazon.com, you can see a listing of the best-selling books on any subject. And if you look at the best-selling books on music, almost half of them of the top ten are by neuroscientists. There are books like This Is Your Brain on Music, or some Oliver Sacks book, or whatever. There are a bunch of these books. Neuroscientists, if you're a music scholar now, you've got to watch out. The neuroscientists are going to take your job away. They're, they, they believe that they're going to explain everything about music from the point of view of neuroscience. Now, I consider myself in the middle on this issue. Okay? I consider myself in the middle. 
I do recognize many, I've studied a lot of, of the, uh, at a very granular level, the research of neuroscience on music. At a very granular level. And I've learned many things. But their view when they push it too far is reductionist. Because you cannot reduce people to their brain. In fact, some people, oh no, that's a, that's a stuff, no. You cannot reduce people to just brain and all phenomena to brain stipulation. And this, but this gets into very deep philosophical issues about what is the self. Is there something called the soul? If the soul exists, is that reside in the brain? And what I, if you get into this literature, there are many interesting things. But when they try to make the leap from the brain to real life experience, there's a big gap. There really is a big gap. And as soon as you get a neuroscientist and you ask them to explain, hey, analyze this Beethoven symphony for me, they can't. At a very primitive level. And so I would say there, there, you raise good points. And over the next 20, 30 years, this is going to be fought hand in tooth. And there's going to be a battle between music scholars and neuroscientists. I don't even think the music scholars realize what's going to come down the pike. Because the neuroscientists are very bold and they get grant money more than us people in music do. And they think they're going to explain everything about music. I'm just saying, I do not, I fundamentally do not believe you can reduce people to the brain. And I fundamentally do not believe you can reduce this rich experience of music that brings people together in communities and brought me together maybe with my wife and all this and explain all that through brain stimulation. I think it's what I call that is reductionist. It takes a very complex phenomenon and reduces it to something very simple but loses a lot. Okay, you're going to want to you have another, we'll give you one more question but we're going to have to give other people a chance to. Well, I'm just, like I say, this is, this is a very deep issue, and it's, you've got to realize this is more than a, 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 an issue of medical science. It's a philosophical issue. And if, you know, if you get philosophers here, and it really, a lot of this is what is the self. What, is, what describes a person? What is the element of, of each individual? Can, I know there is a belief that you can reduce every aspect of our life to a brain stimulation. And you could push this so much, you get a matrix kind of view is that we don't even exist. Uh, it's all just stimulation on our brain. But I just, if you want to make a case for that, you need to make a stronger case than you have because there's so much this leaves out. I mean, I know the, the view that, that uh, objects don't exist, there's just sense perceptions, and Bishop Barclay said that the real objects don't exist, but I know if you stand in front of a train, and that train's coming at you, when it hits you, it is more than the brain stimulation, it's more the sense perception. And I, no. And, and, and so, there's so much that's left out in this, 
that, the, and I know that once again, this is going to play out over the next 20 years, but there are many people think exactly what you do, but they need to do a much better job of explaining musical phenomena before they're going to get me as an editor. And we, need, we do need, and we do need people to walk in. We've got to give a couple more people a chance to ask questions. You can come out and, and debate me afterwards if you want. So, yes. Yeah. What was the song for me and my wife? Well, you know, we had okay. We had some some songs that we specifically played at our wedding. These are love songs by Frank Sinatra. It's, it's, I'm very old school. When you get to the love songs I like, we're talking Billie Holiday, Frank Sinatra. You know, once you get to the Beatles, that's like modernistic for me, for my personal Frank Sinatra. Yeah. Let's have one more question. Uh, yes. Let's have one more question. Uh, yes. Well, you've picked on pe two people that actually I've paid very attention, close attention to. When I talk about a dialectic of the love song, I'm explicitly referring to Hegelian dialectic. And in terms of Zen, I considered for a long time writing a book called The People's History of Music, which would definitely evoke Zen's book. I considered for a long time writing a book called The People's History of Music. Uh, people's History. So I, I think that although the specifics of what Zen is doing are very different, than the specifics I'm in. The philosophical idea is you've got to look at what's happening to most people and not just what happens to these small numbers. So yeah, I'm, I'm sympathetic with, with both those points, and I think you rightly see that they're very integrated in my view. Well, I'd be happy to answer other questions afterwards. Feel free to come on up and talk. Thank you again. You've been a wonderful audience.